once again to Exploring Arda, a Tolkien-centered podcast where I'm your host, Jackson, and I go through a bunch of Tolkien's works other than Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Uh, welcome back to uh, another episode of none other than The Fall of Numenor. Hooray! <laughs> I always like doing the little uh, <laughs> announcer voice. It's always kind of fun. But yeah, so we're back at part two, Fall of Numenor, and as for this part two, there's going to be... Uh, a bunch of kind of like separated segments that I'm going to be reading through uh, just because I'm more for like the the story and kind of the history because like this next one are all about like uh, geog the geography and the animals and the birds of Numenor, which is, it's cool, it's nice, and it's really, really super in-depth. But as for like the story-wise, I feel like I'm just going to be skipping ahead a few pages here and there for this episode. So I've feel like it was just kind of like better that way uh, to get at least some of the history and the importance kind of settled into here before the uh, the main events start rolling in. So that's going to be for this episode. Uh, be sure also to check out the Bookworm Cinema Productions uh, channel, which is uh, on YouTube, but it's also on Spotify, Apple, <laughs> Anchor, and I think I said YouTube. <laughs> uh, it is my other podcast that I pretty much co-host with my friends. So we have a good time and check it out. But also be sure to subscribe as well to this channel. I would greatly appreciate it. And before I forget, at the end, also be sure to check out my fantasy book called The Lands of Ordia, Power of Heaven, which is on Amazon. So I'm just going to do that super quick on each, <laughs> on each episode now, uh, just to kind of get it out of the way. Uh, check it all out. It would it would be awesome if you could. So, with all that being said, we can go into the next uh, sections of the Fall of Numenor. Now, this first part, um, if I can flip this image around, uh, is the the map, pretty much the geography of Numenor itself. So I'm going to be reading the first half or so, just because. It's like the layout and the importance of the actual geography. Uh, the other parts are are short, but I, I just kind of glanced over it earlier. And um, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. So, <laughs> so here we go. Back to it. <laughs> the geography of Numenor. Accurate charts of Numenor were made at various periods before its downfall, but none of these survived in the disaster. They were deposited in the guild house of the Venturers, and this was confiscated by the kings and removed to the western haven of And Andunier. I'm gonna say Andunier. Uh, all its records perished. Maps of Numenor were long preserved in the archives of the kings of Gondor in Middle Earth, but these appear to have been derived in part from old drawings made from memory by early settlers, and the better ones from a single chart with little detail beyond sea surround sea soundings along the coast and descriptions of the ports and their approaches. That was originally in the ship of Elendil, leader of those who escaped the downfall. Descriptions of the land and of its flora and fauna were also preserved in Gondor, but they were not accurate or detailed, nor did they distinguish clearly between the state of the land at different periods, being vague about its condition at the time of the first settlements. Since all such na <laughs> natures matters were the study of men of lore and Numenor, and many accurate natural histories and geographies must have been composed. Uh, it would appear l that, like nearly all else of the arts and sciences of Numenor, at its high tide, they disappeared in the downfall. So, as a quick little introduction, it's pretty much saying that the supposed map that we get, this the star-shaped island, is accurate but not 100%, because a lot of the original information seemed to like perished after the downfall so and then but then the stuff that is you know quote unquote re recorded and reported uh it was kept uh, a lot with the kings of gondor which i suppose makes sense so uh, that's pretty much what it was <laughs> what i think is pretty much saying so uh back to it here uh of the shape of numenor the land of numenor resembled an outline of five pointed star or pentangle with essential portions some 250 miles across, north and south, sorry, I got an itch there, <laughs> and east and west, from which extended five large peninsular promontories. There you go. I always have a problem <laughs> pronouncing that. 
These promontories were regarded as separate regions, and they were named Florostar, the Northlands, and Astar, Westlands. Hi, oh, hold on, Hyar, Hyardastar, and there you go, Southwest, Southwest lands, Hyorastar, Southeast lands, and Orastar, Eastlands. The central portion was called Mittelmar, Inlands, and it had no coast except the land about Romena and the head of its Firth. A small part of the Mittelmar was, however, separated from the rest and called Arendor, the King's Land. In Arendor were the haven of Romena, the Mendeltarma, and Armenelos, the city of the kings, and it was at all times the most populous region of Numenor. The promontories, though these were not all of precisely the same shape or size, were roughly 100 miles across and rather more than 200 miles long. Line drawn from the northernmost point of the forest star of, to the southernmost of the Hyarna Hy star, man, these, these names <laughs> lay more or less directly north and south at the period of the map. This line was somewhat more than 700 miles long, and each line drawn from the end of one promontory to the end of another, and passing through the land, was more or less of the same length. So, yeah. <laughs> and I think I'm going to do a little bit more here, so I'm going to read about the Mittelmar, which I think is like the most important part of it, so it says here, the Mittelmar was raised above the general level of the promontories, not reckoning the height of any mountain or hills in these and at the settlement appears to have few trees and have consisted mainly of grasslands and low downs. Nearly at its center, though somewhat near the eastern edge, stood the tall mountain called the Meneltarma, Pillar of the Heavens. It was about 3,000 feet high above the plain. The lower slopes of the Meneltarma were gentle and partly grass-covered, but the mountain grew ever steeper, and the last 500 feet were in places unscalable save by the climbing road. Uh, the base of the metal tarma sloped gently into the surrounding plain, but it extended, after the fashion of roots, five long low ridges outwards in the direction of the five promontories of the land, and these were called tar tarma sunder, the roots of the pillar. But for the most part, the middle mar was a region of pastures, in the southwest there were rolling downs of grass, and there in the emerie was the chief region of the shepherds. So. Uh, that I feel like the middle mar is like the center of pretty much uh, the whole island and it's the most populous because pretty much it has it has a mountain, it has trees, and it has plains. It has pretty much all the good stuff and well, pretty much everything except for the coast. <laughs> but even the coast is, I wouldn't really say it's like it's close because if you go to the center of, of the middle mar it's kind of all more mountainous and hills but it is the the, the king's uh, land, pretty much, is the middle of Mars. So that's kind of what I got out of it. Um, the hold on a minute, <laughs> I actually forgot where I got from, but that's kind of like what I was reading over there. So when it comes to the natural life of Numenor, it talks mainly mainly about like animals, beasts of the wood, uh, seawater and freshwater fish. Uh, the burrs that they have there, trees and plants, and it just goes on for a good like seven or eight pages. Um, so if you guys really do want to go super in depth with the birds, beasts, and fishes of Numenor, <laughs> and how mankind, the Edain, dealt with all that stuff, you can definitely go and read it. Because uh, for this episode, I kind of wanted to make sure I got like the main main stuff <laughs> down just to kind of to kind of speed along the book so uh the next one the next se segment i'll be uh reading is the life of the numenorians so here we go of cities of old the chief city and haven of numenor was in the midst of its western coast and it was called andunie because it faced the sunset with its town beside the shore and many other dwellings climbing up the steep slope behind Hard by metal tarma upon a hill was Armenelos, fairest of cities, and there stood the tower in the citadel that was raised by Elros, son of Arendil, whom the Valar appointed uh, to be the first king of the Dunedain. So we get like the two big cities that are pretty much well known across the, the whole island and even to uh, even to the Valar. They, they know about uh, Armenelos especially, so uh, pretty cool. So uh, next one is called Of Belief and Worship. So, near to the center of the Middlemar stood the tall mountain called the Meneltarma, Pillar of the Heavens, sacred to the worship of Eru Iluvatar. 
A winding spiral road was made upon it, beginning at its foot upon the south and ending below the lip of the summit upon the north. For the summit was somewhat flattened and depressed and could contain a great multitude, but it remained untouched by hands throughout the history of Numenor. No building, no raised altar, not even a pile of undressed, undressed stones ever stood there, and no other likeness of a temple did the Numenorians possess in all the days of their grace until the coming of Sauron. There no tool or weapon had ever been born, and there none might speak any word, save the king only. Thrice only in each year the king spoke, offering prayer for the coming year at the Erukirme. Erukirme, I'll do that. In the first days of spring, praise of Eru, Lu Eru Iluvatar at the, at the Eru Laitale <laughs> in midsummer, and thanksgiving to him at the Eru Han Hantale at the end of autumn. At these, time, at these times, the king ascended the mountain on, on foot, followed by a great concourse of the people, clad in white and garlanded, but silent. At other times, the people were free to climb to the summit alone or in company. But it is said that the silence was so great that even a stranger, stranger ignorant of Numenor in all its history, if he were transported thither, would not have dared to speak aloud. No bird ever came there, save only eagles. If anyone approached the summit, at once three eagles would appear and alight upon three rocks near to the western edge. But at the time of the three prayers, they did not descend. Remaining in the sky and hovering above the people, they were called the Witnesses of Manwe, and they were believed to be sent by him from Amun to keep watch upon the holy mountain and upon all the land. The Numenorians thus began a great new, new good, and as, a, and as monotheists, but with only one physical center of worship. The summit of the mountain Meneltarma, pillar of heaven, literally, for they did not conce conceive of the sky as a divine residence in the center of Numenor, but it had no building and no temple, as all such things had evil associations. So, that's really cool. Um, that's what I... Th oh yeah, and then there's another, <laughs> another painting by... Yep, it is Alan Lee, so if you guys want to check that out, uh, it is really, really cool stuff. Uh, the detail is... Immaculate is so good. Uh, just a little presentation, I suppose, of Numenor. But uh, it is really cool how they have like little, um, I guess, like supposed like festivals, but like it's more for like praise of Eru Iluvatar, the creator, which is really nice. Like for me, like I said before, it's just nice to hear about the Valar and even Ilu Iluvatar, which is. I mean, we haven't heard about him in a long time, especially after reading the Silmarillion. It's like he just kind of, his name kind of like vanishes for a, a long, long time. And it's kind of a bummer that way, but um, I just really like how they have like three separate, uh, what was it, prayers, yeah, uh, pretty much dedicated to Ilu, Ilu <laughs> I can't talk, <laughs> Iluvatar, there you go. <laughs> and it's really cool how the eagles are basically the watchers for Manwe that he wants to keep even this mountain that is sacred to Erulivatar safe from all evils, all evil associations. So, <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, next section that I got is of skills and crafts. So this one's a little bit just to, pretty much just to let others know that they, that their skills have been going on for a good many years. <laughs> so here it is, of skills and crafts. The Edain brought with them much lore, and the knowledge of many crafts, and numerous craftsmen who had learned from the Eldar, directly or through their fathers, besides uh, preserving lore and traditions of their own. But they would bring with them few materials, save for the tools of their crafts, and for long all metals in Numenor were precious metals. They brought with them many treasures of gold and silver, and gems also, but they did not find these things in Numenor. They loved them for their beauty, and it was this love that first aroused in, their, in them cupidity, in later days when they fell under the shadow and became proud and unjust in their dealings with lesser folk of Middle-earth. Of the elves of Aresia in the days of their friendship, they had at times gifts of gold and silver and jewels, but such things were rare and prized in all the earlier centuries, until the power of the kings was spread to the coasts of the east. Some metals they found in Numenor, and as their cunning in mining and in smelting and smithying swiftly grew things of iron and copper became common. Lead they also had. Iron and steel they needed most for the tools of the craftsmen and for the axes of the woodsmen. Among the rites of the Edain were weaponsmiths, and they had with them the teaching of the Noldar, 
acquired great skill in the forging of swords, axe blades, axe blades, spearheads, and knives, and is observed elsewhere. If they had the mine, they could have easily had surpassed the evil kings of Middle-earth in the making of war and the forging of weapons, but they were become men of peace. Swords, swords the guild of weaponsmiths still made for the preservation of the craft, though most of their labor was spent on the fashioning of tools for the uses of peace. The king and most of the great chieftains possessed swords as heirlooms of their fathers, and at times they would still give a sword as a gift to their heirs. A new sword was made for the king's heir to be given to him on the day on which his title was conferred. But no man wore a sword in Numenor, not even the days of wars in Middle-earth, unless he was actually armed for battle. Thus for long there was practically no weapons of warlike intent made in Numenor. Many things uh, made could of course be so used, axes, spears, and bows. The boyars were a uh, great craft. They made bows of many kinds, long bows and smaller bows, especially those used for shooting from horseback, and they also devised crossbows, at first used mainly against predator, predatory animals, or <laughs> birds, sorry. <laughs> shooting with bows was one of the great sports and pastimes of the men, and one in which young, young women also took part. The Numenorean men, being tall and powerful, could shoot with speed and accuracy upon foot from great longbows whose shafts would carry a great distance, some 600 yards or more. Wow. And at lesser range were of great penetration. So, oh, that's really cool. So, uh, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't re read through that earlier. <laughs> 600 yards, that's a long, long shot. But, eh, well, they're skilled people, I suppose. So, you know, that's, that's pretty great. <laughs> so, uh, pretty much that they learned... Uh, to, to make their crafts uh, through both history, lore, kind of passed down traditions, things like that, but also just kind of like making their own way, you know, through through their life of in, in Numenor. And it is definitely a, a people of peace. They, they're they close to the Valar, but not quite so, and they kind of respect that in a way. From the last chapter, we kind of, or last chapter, <laughs> last episode, we know that they are closer to the Valar, but they also have limits, and they pretty much accept it, and we're like, okay, just make make their home there, and they do. <laughs> so, it's pretty cool. I like that, that Numenorians are very peaceful people. So, uh, next, uh, it is part of, just part of the life of the Numenorians, which um, kind of goes along with the whole elves um, and the, the the blessed realm, you know, of Valinor, and then the elves occasionally come by <laughs> and check up on them, so it's pretty cool, so... Here we go again. While obedient to the Valar ban on sailing to the west, people from the Blessed Realm often visited them, and so their knowledge and arts reached almost an elvish height. From Avalone, the haven of the Eldar upon Aresia, at times the firstborn would still come sailing to Numenor in oarless boats, as white birds flying from the sunset. For the friendship that was between the peoples, they brought to Numenor many gifts, birds of song and fragrant flowers and herbs of great virtue. And his seedling they brought of Caliborn, the white tree that grew in the midst of Aresia, and that it was that and that was in its turn a seedling of Galathil Galathilion, the tree of Tuna, the image of Telperion, that Yavanna gave to the Eldar in the Blessed Realm. And the tree grew and blossomed in the courts of the king in in Armenolos. Nimloth it was named, and flowered in the evening, and the shadows of night it filled with its fragrance. Uh, and the note says here. Nimloth was the ancestor of what would become known as the White Tree of Gondor, and memorialized as a symbol of the line of kings and stewards of Gondor. The genealogy of the White Tree in its various manifestations is long, dating from the First Age through until the ending of the Third and the beginning of the Fourth Ages. It is recorded that for many years following the founding of Numenor, the life lived by the Numenorians was referred to as the Days of Bliss. Thus the years passed, and while Middle-earth went backward, yeah, went backward and light and wisdom faded, the Dúnedain dwelt under the protection of the Valar, and in the friendship of the Eldar, and they increased in stature both mind and body. For though this people used still their own speech, their kings and lords knew and spoke also the elven tongue, which they had learned in the days of their alliance, and thus they held converse until still with the Eldar, whether of Aresia or of the westlands of Middle-earth. And the lore masters among them learned also the high Eldar tongue of the Blessed Realm, in which much story uh, and song was preserved from the beginning of the world. 
and they made letters and scrolls and books, and wrote in them many things of wisdom, and wonder in the high tide of the realm, of which all is now forgot. So, also another really, really cool thing, because they, uh, yeah, it's it's just nice that they, the Edain, the mankind, even though they are mortal, and a lot of them, I mean, obviously a lot of them, the Silmarillion, <laughs> caused a lot of strife. Uh, back and forth, you know, being twisted to Morgoth's will and whatnot. Uh, but now that... I feel like now that Morgoth... Oops, sorry. Was uh, defeated and he pretty much is eternally trapped <laughs> uh, under the protec protection of the Valar. Uh, I, I suppose the Edain and the Mankind kind of have a, a loosened feel about it. Even if Sauron is still out there, obviously they kind of like okay well maybe we should like loosen up a little bit have some friends with the, with the elves <laughs> since we're so close to the valar now and that's kind of what happens which is really nice to see so all right so now that we have talked a little bit about mankind and the elves uh we go to a, a little section a tiny tiny little section called um many dwarves leaving their old cities in erdluin go to moria and swell its numbers so uh, before I get this, uh, check, make sure it's good. All right, here we go. Durin is the name that the dwarves use for the eldest of the seven fathers of their race, and the ancestor of all the kings of the Longbeards. He slept alone until, in the deeps of time and the awakening of that people, he came to <laughs> as a Nol Bazar. Sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and in the caves above, there we go, Kelad Zaram. There we go. In the east of the Misty Mountains, he made his dwelling where afterwards were the Mines of Moria, renowned in song. There he lived so long that he was known far and wide as Durin the Deathless, yet in the end he died before the Eldar, <laughs> the Eldar, the Elder days had passed, and his tomb was in Khazad Dum. doom but his line never failed, and five times an heir was born in his house, so like to his forefather, that he received the name of Durin. He was indeed held by the dwarves to be the Deathless that returned, for they have many strange tales and beliefs concerning themselves and their fate in the world. After the end of the first age, the power and wealth of Khazad Dum was much increased, for it was enriched by many people and much lore and craft when the sorry, I can't turn the page when the ancient cities of Nagrod and Belagost and the Blue Mountains were ruined at the breaking of Thangoradrim. Uh, and in a little note says here, in the Fellowship of the Ring, it is, to it is told how, at the Council of Elrond in the Third Age, Gloin the Dwarf spoke of that time when, amid the splendor of their works and hand, of hand the hearts of the dwarves of the Lonely Mountain were troubled. He said, It is now many years ago that a shadow of disquiet fell upon our people. Whence it came we did not at first perceive. Words began to be whispered in secret. It is said that we were hemmed in a narrow place and that greater wealth and splendor would be found in a wider world. Some spoke of Moria, the mighty works of our fathers that are called in our own tongue, Khazad-dū, and they declared that now, at last, we had the power and numbers to return. So, a little bit of a section here that are like, hey, we, get, we can't forget the dwarves! <laughs> but uh, pretty much during this time is very expansive, I feel like, uh, especially in Middle-earth realms. So obviously this is where khazad and Moria come from. Uh, kind of started by uh, Durin um, and his long, long lineage, Durin the Deathless. Very cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's just like a little note of like what the dwarves are up to in this time. So I like I like to hear about them, uh, oh, you know, from time to time, because they're still they're still here, guys. So, <laughs> all right. Next, uh, very quick session uh, section uh, is called Death of Elros Tar Minyatar which is basically Elrond's uh, brother. So, here we go. Elros Tar Minyatur uh, ruled the Numenorans for 400 years and 10. And for, for to the Numenorans, long life had been granted, and they remained unwearied for thrice the span of mortal men in Middle-earth. But to Arendil's son, the longest life of any man was given, and to his descendants, a lesser span, and yet one greater than to others, even of the Numenorians. And so it was until the coming of the shadow when the years of the Numenorians began to wane. Elros uh, had four children, three sons, Fardamir, Noloman, uh, Manwendil, and Atanalkar, oh <laughs> and one daughter, his second-born, Tindomiel. 
Some of these elvish names are so hard to pronounce, <laughs> but it is. It's part of the lore. It's okay. So, uh, continues on here. The eldest of Elros Tarminutur's children, Tar Vardamir, was called Nolaman, learned one, for his chief love was for ancient lore, which he gathered from elves and men. Upon the departure of Elros, being then 381 years of age, he did not ascend the throne, but gave the scepter to his son. He is nonetheless accounted the second of the kings, and is deemed to have reigned one year. It remained the custom thereafter until the days of Tar Atanamir that the king should yield the scepter to his successor before he died, and the kings died of free will while yet in vigor of mind. Tar, Tar Var Vardamir had four children, Amandil, Vardilme, the daughter, Aulandil, and Nolandil. <laughs> this is so hard for me. <laughs> uh, and then it says here another uh, quick thing here. While chronicled as Numenor's third king, Tar Amandil was in truth the second ruler of the realm since his father, Vardamir Nolaman, had chosen not to ascend the throne. Amandil was born in the year 192, and the name Amandil comes from the word Amun and Dil, meaning in Quenya, someone who is a lover or friend of Amun, the Blessed Realm. Very cool. And Tar Amandil had two sons, Elendil and Erendur, and a daughter, Myron. So, just like a little brief, like, hey, here's some readers, readers, lead, leaders <laughs> in Numenor, and pretty much how they passed down the scepter to the next the next guy in line to, to pretty much get Numenor <laughs> up up and running once again. You know, make sure everything's good. So, just another brief notes and stuff. So. Uh, next section, which is actually going to be probably the last one for this episode, is called Sauron Begins to Stir Again in Middle-Earth. Okay. So, here we go. And this actually begins with a, um, a note here. So, in the long letter to Milton Waldman, Outlining the chronology of events in the first three ages of Middle-earth, in all likelihood written in 1951, Tolkien sketched a picture of the world in the Dark Days at the beginning of the Second Age. In the great battles against the first enemy, Morgoth, the lands were broken and ruined, and the west of Middle-earth became desolate. Also the orcs, goblins, and other monsters bred by the first enemy were not wholly destroyed. As was told at the conclusion of the Quintus Silmarillion, but through the intervention of the Valar, Morgoth had been thrust through the door of night, beyond the walls of the world, into the timeless void. Yet the lies that Melkor, the mighty and accursed, Morgoth Boglir, the power, in ter power of terror and of hate, sowed in the hearts of elves and men, are a seed that does not die, and cannot be destroyed, and ever and anon it sprouts anew, and will bear f dark fruit even until the latest days. Those now new sprouting lies and hatreds were tended and nurtured by Sauron. All right. Of old, there was Sauron the Maya, whom the Sindar and Beleriand uh, named Gorthar. In the beginning of Arda, Melkor seduced him to his allegiance, and he became the greatest and most trusted of the servants of the enemy, and the most perilous. For he could assume many forms, and for long, if he willed, he could still appear noble and beautiful, so as to deceive all the most wary. When Thingorajim was broken and Morgoth overthrown, Sauron put on his fair hue again and did ob 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 obeisance? Sure, I don't know, obeisance <laughs> to Aonwe, the herald of Manwe, and abjured all his evil deeds. Uh, and some and some hold that this was not at at first falsely done, but that Sauron in truth repented, if only out of fear, being dismayed by the fall of Morgoth and the great wrath of the lords of the West. But it was not within the power of Eonwe to pardon those of his own order, and he commanded Sauron to return to Amun, and there receive the judgment of Manwe. Then Sauron was ashamed, and he was unwilling to return in humiliation and to receive from the Valar a sentence, it might be, of long servitude in proof of his good faith. Uh, for under Morgoth his power had been great. Therefore, when Eonwe departed, he hid himself in Middle-earth, and he fell back into evil. For the bonds that Morgoth had laid upon him uh, were very strong. So, uh, it, it as a little break b before I kind of go further into it, we get uh, pretty much Sauron, who at the end of the Silmarillion knows everything that he has has done. Obviously, it kind of like says again that Sauron is very, very dangerous, very perilous, as it says. Oh, excuse me, and he can assume many forms, which is personally one of my favorite parts of the chapter of Baron and Luthien when he shapeshifts 
into all of his pretty much forms of, of possible dread, I suppose. Um, <laughs> just to try to scare off Baron and Luthien, but it kind of fails. <laughs> so, But he is very, very powerful and very dangerous. Obviously, it, I think it was also said in the Silmarillion that behind Morgoth, it was like it was Sauron right next to him. So that's how bad he is. And he didn't want to pretty much take all the things that he did wrong with with under the under the judgment of Manwe, so he was like, I'm gonna hide myself in Middle Earth and and maybe hope for the best, and then he just ends up just turning bad again. So kind of a bummer, but that's kind of Sauron's um I don't know, his uh, his return to evil. So back at it here again. In his letter to Milton Waldman, Tolkien would write of Sauron. He lingers in Middle Earth, very slowly, beginning with fair motives. The reorganizing and re rehab re rehabilitation of the ruins of Middle Earth. Neglected by the gods, he becomes a reincarnation of evil, and a thing lusting for complete power, and so consumed ever more fiercely with hate, especially of gods and elves. Among Tolkien's later writings, published uh, posthumously, <laughs> there you go, I, I, that burden always trips me up, by Christopher Tolkien in his History of Middle Earth, Tolkien gave consideration to Sauron's motives that indicate a striking subtlety of reflection on the characteristics of his protagonist. Sauron was greater, effectively, in the Second Age than Morgoth at the end of the First. Why? Because though he was far smaller by na natural stature, he had not yet fallen so low. Eventually, he also squandered his power of being in the endeavor to gain control of others, but he was not obliged to expend so much of himself. To gain domination over Arda, Morgoth had let most of his being pass into the physical const constituents of the earth. Hence, all things that were born on earth and lived on and by it, beasts or plants or incarnate spirits, were liable to be stained. Sauron, however, inherited the corruption of Arda, and only spent his much more limited power on the rings, for it was the creatures of earth in their minds and wills that he desired to dominate. In this way, Sauron was also wiser than Melkor Morgoth. Sauron was, Sauron was not a beginner of discord, and he probably knew more about the music, the music of the Ainur, the great song of creation before the beginning of time, than did Melkor, whose mind had always been filled with his own plans and devices and gave little attention to other things. Sauron had never reached the stage of nihilistic madness. He did not object to the existence of the world, so long as he could do what he liked with it. He still had the relics of positive purposes that descended from the good of the nature, of, in which he began. It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall and of his relapse, that he loved order and coordination, and disliked all confusion and wasteful friction. But like all minds of this cast, Sauron's love, originally, or later, mere understanding of other individual intelligences, was correspondingly weaker. And though the only real good in, or rational motive for, all this ordering and planning and organization was the good of all inhabitants of Arda even admitting Sauron's right to be their supreme lord. His plans, the idea coming from his own isolated mind, became the sole object of his will, and an end, the end in itself. And I got like one, one little paragraph here to finish, so. Elsewhere in Middle-earth there was peace for many years, yet the lands were the most part savage and desolate, save only where the people of Beleriand came. Many elves dwelt there indeed, as they had dwelt through the countless years, wandering free in the wide lands far from the sea. But they were Avari, to whom the deeds of Valerian were but a rumor, and Valinor only a distant name. And in the south and in the further east men multiplied, and most of them turned to evil, for Sauron was at work. Seeing the desolation of the world, Sauron said in his heart that the Valar, having overthrown Morgoth, had again forgotten Middle-earth, and his pride grew apace. So, now, I, I feel like that's a good stopping point for this, uh, for this episode, because, um... Yeah, Sauron rising again <laughs> from his former master, Morgoth. Um, yeah, it would only make sense, um, especially um, just because I have mentioned it before in my Silmarillion review, that it kind of like bothered me a little bit. I don't say like bothered. It just kind of got me curious that like, why did Valar practically forget about Middle-earth and Beleriand until the very end when they go and capture Morgoth and throw him in the timeless void. So it's it, it's that same reason that Sauron gets his his chance at pretty much coming from the shadows and rising to his full power. 
And I totally agree actually with what they were pretty much saying in the book is that Sauron is is powerful in the way that he manipulates through not like mind control but like he's he's a good you know um <laughs> well I can't, I can't think of the the word right now but <laughs> he's able to trick people very very easy just through the mind and the wills and that's what he really wants I mean, it makes sense because the rings are all about dominating people not physically but mentally and if you do that successfully that's terrifying that's that's probably even more terrifying than controlling a person physically is, is controlling them mentally because you can literally control what they do what their actions do and what they say it's terrifying and that's what he does with uh saruman really with um the power of the palantir i mean it takes one little object to to ensnare him and promise him you know pretty much lies so it's interesting to see the Sauron coming from the beginning of the Silmarillion where he's like you know serving under Morgoth you know just like you're like okay well this is you know Dark Lord Morgoth I can't stand up against him and then Morgoth is uh, thrown into the void and then Sauron's like mm, what should I do now should I should I go to Manwe and face the <laughs> face the consequences that I've done uh no and then he goes and hides and then he sees that the valor are like not there they're not present so he's just like well i guess it's my time <laughs> so and that's kind of like what i kind of like that's like the gist of it in simpler terms it's just very interesting of how sauron rises again and not only this time but obviously again in the third age because his spiritual self is very very strong so uh yeah that is going to be all for this chapter. Um, I am already enjoying <laughs> reading all about the histories and the surrounding uh, lore that um, pretty much makes Numenor a very um, notable and special place, especially in all of the Tolkien lore. Uh, I mean, a lot of people know about it, Numenor. Uh, obviously, a lot of people know about the Dúnedain because of Aragorn and Lord of the Rings and whatnot, but this is basically like the deep, deep, back story of his land so very cool stuff um yeah and now i think finally <laughs> for the last time that is all that i have for tonight um as usual uh, i know that i already said it in the beginning but check out my own fantasy book called the lands of ordia power of heaven it is a, the book one out of five and i am writing the second book currently and I'm definitely enjoying it. Uh, it is, the second book is very much a, a personal project of mine. I'm putting a lot more of my personal um, effort into it than the first. First one was kind of make sure it's out there, um, which I kind of regret doing, but I mean, now I gotta fix it with the second book. So it's a little bit better than the first. So snag a first copy of the first one so that you can uh, see what I'm talking about. So with all that being said, just stay tuned for another episode. And may the light of Elbereth be with you all. Farewell.